Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your blessings, for your love, and for this uh, beautiful day that you have given to us. Lord, we are here because we would like to listen to your voice. Uh, in a special way, bless our brother who is in charge to preach, to share with us your message. For the reason we ask a special blessing for him, 
given him your power. It's not his power, it's your power. Your Holy Spirit. And all of us, we ask him, open our hearts, our minds, to listen to your word through your servant. And for Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for the prayer. It's scripture reading time. Our scripture reading will be a little different this time. And then I will ask you to stand for the honor of listening to the word of God. Yeah. Our scripture reading will be taken from John 14, verses 6 and 7. I'll be reading it from the Amplified Version. And it says, I'm reading you right here. Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had really known me, you would also have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Good morning, church. Good morning. Or is it after morning? Oh, good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. Because it's always morning if you're with God. Because there's never a night, right? Amen. The title of my sermon is, Do You Really Know God? I mean, do you really know someone? When you have a relationship with someone, or you have a friend, and you think you know them, and then you hear in the news something happened that's terrible. And you're thinking, did I really know that person? And uh, by the way, I really like the special music. I know that God picked it out because it, it was so perfectly fitting. I'm going to start off by reading uh, John 14 from a paraphrase uh, written by a uh, medical doctor. Don't let fear and doubt trouble your hearts. Put your full trust in God and trust me too. In my father's home, there is room for all who want to be there. If this were not true, I would have told you. I am going there to direct all my Father's resources, who are not only preparing heaven for you, but also preparing you for heaven. And when all things are ready, I will come back and take everyone who has been brought back into unity with the principles of heaven to be there with me, so that we may all be together. You now know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas was confused and said, But Lord, we don't know where you are going or how to get there, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered gently, I am the way back to my Father. I am the truth, revealing my Father's character and the principles upon which life is based. I am the source of all life. I am the bridge, and no one comes to the Father except through me because all truth revealing the Father has been provided by me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well, for the Father and I are one. From now on, you do know him and have seen him, for I am the Father's thoughts made visible and audible. Philip then said, Lord, then show us the Father, and that will be all we ever need. Jesus answered patiently, don't you know me, Philip, even after all I have said and done among you over these years together? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Don't you understand that I am an exact representation of the Father? So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in complete unity with the Father? In mind, heart, attitude, character, method, disposition, principle, and will? And the Father is in unity with me? 
The words I speak are not my own ideas or methods, but are the exact thoughts of my Father whose character and principles live in me. His work is being carried out through me. Believe me when I tell you that I am in complete unity in every way with my Father, and He is in complete unity in every way with me. Or at least believe all the evidence I have provided that reveals this truth. I tell you the truth. Anyone who genuinely trusts me will also be in unity with the Father and will reveal His character, just as I have been doing. His life will be a further revelation of the life-giving power of God and the healing power of His methods. My life reveals the truth of God's character and methods, but those who trust in me will reveal that God's methods, when applied in trust via the Spirit of God, actually heal and transform those who are deformed by sin. I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask that is in harmony with my character, methods, and principles, so that the Son may bring honor and glory to the Father by revealing the healing and life-giving power of His methods. You may ask me for anything in harmony with my character and methods, and I will do it. If you love me, you will practice all my methods and principles because you understand, agree, and prefer my ways. And the Father and I will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, who will enlighten your minds to comprehend the truth. Those who prefer the methods of this world, the methods of deceit, cannot accept him, because, having rejected truth, they don't recognize or know him. But you know him, for you know me, and he represents all that I am. He will establish my character, methods, and principles within you. I will not abandon you and leave you as orphans. I will come back to you. It is not long until I leave this world. Those who reject me also reject the spirit of truth, and therefore their minds will be so darkened that they will no longer be able to see me or comprehend my character and methods. But you will continue to see and understand me more and more because you accept the spirit of truth. Because I live, you who have accepted me will also live. On the day I leave this world, you will finally know that I am in every way in complete unity with the Father, and you are in unity with me, and I with you. Those who understand my methods and principles and incorporate them into their lives are the ones who love me and embrace all that I stand for. Those who love me will be transformed back into complete perfection by my Father, and I too will love them back to health and share myself with them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, asked, But Lord, why will you show yourself to us and not to the rest of the world? Jesus answered, All are given freedom to choose their own course. Those who love me will choose to practice all my methods and principles because they understand, agree, and prefer my ways. My Father will transform such ones back into perfection, and we will be united with them and make our home with them. But those who do not love me will reject truth and evidence and choose not to practice my methods and principles. The words I have spoken are not mine only. They are the words of the Father who sent me. I have said all this while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send as my representative, will enlighten your minds with all truth and will remind you of all the evidence I have given you. Peace with God and peace of heart and mind I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, expecting to get something in return. No. I give freely, because I love you and want only the best for you. So don't worry or let your hearts be consumed with fear and doubt. You heard me say, I am going away, but I am coming back to be with you. If you love me, you will realize that this is for your benefit, and you will be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is even greater than I. I have told you before it happens so that when it does, you will be confident that I do know the beginning from the end, and none of this has taken me by surprise. 
and your confidence in me will then increase. I will not be here to speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world of selfishness is coming. He has no right to harm me, and there is nothing I have done that warrants his malice toward me. But the world must learn the truth that all I do is from love for the Father. Therefore, I will finish the work that the Father has given me to do, reveal the truth about the Father's supreme love, perfect character, and faultless methods, and procure the remedy to sin, while exposing Satan for the liar and murderer he is, and his methods as the source of all destruction and death. Come, it is time for us to leave. version of uh, the paraphrase. It really clarifies the story. And I, I can stop here and be finished with the sermon, and I think it's already well written and spoken. But stay this for the opening. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, be about my lips that I speak your words and tell everyone how much you love them. Pray this in my Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bible, from cover to cover, speaks of how much God loves us. Now, it is littered with our inability to love God. And that causes a lot of confusion to some people, but when you read it in its contents, from cover to cover, God speaks of how much he loves us. In Genesis, in the beginning, God talks about his love for us because he says he created his world and he spoke and it became. He spoke and it became. Right? But on the sixth day, he knelt down, and he took his hands, his formed man, from the dust of the earth, and he bent down and kissed the kiss of life into him. I mean, that's, if God can just create an entire Milky Way galaxy by saying, let there be stars in heaven, but yet it took the time to form man from the dust of the earth, to bend over place his lips on ours. The word of God says that God knows every hair on our body and numbers of it. Because Bible writers did not understand things like what we do understand today, DNA, and how cells are created in the wondrous creation of the human body. So they so the smallest thing that they could possibly think of and, and mentioned it. You see, in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, he wrote the DNA for you and I. He could see in his creation who you were going to be. Then going through the Bible, you have people like Noah, a hero, who heard the word of God, prepared an ark, and saved his family through faith. Then you have other patriarchs like Abraham, who heard the word of God, and through his faith has formed a whole nation. And not just that, but created an avenue where the Messiah could come to this world and to born, to live, and ultimately to die under Satan's wrath. In the story of Joseph, you remember the story of his kids? He was Joseph in many colors, and he got sold by his brothers into slavery, spent time in prison. But ultimately, where did Joseph end up? Wasn't he the prime minister of Egypt? 
Once when the Pharaoh says, go Joseph, you take care of this. And he said something, didn't all the servants say, yes, sir. And they went off and did it, even if it seemed a little strange to when his family visited. And he told them to put this cup into one of the bags. And, uh, and then he says, arrest them. But they listened. I mean, he had absolute power except for the Pharaoh. And this story that's in the Bible is not there just because, oh, wow, that was a great story. But it has a, such a deep spiritual meaning because God has a reward for us. He calls us our children. And if we are children of a king, then you and I are prince and princesses. Amen. Royal family. Amen. In this story of Joseph, it talks about our life in this world, injustice, hardship, because evil people are constantly plotting against us by the prodding of Satan. Because we know that from the story of Job, right? Because Satan is identified as he who brings all trials and tribulations upon the earth, not God. Bible writer says, give God the credit for everything only because God allows it. Satan cannot do anything unless God allows it. But, strife, pain, sufferings, illness, cancer, blood sugar problems, deformities, they're all the cause of Satan. But the good news is, if you read the story of Joseph, is that there's a day coming when the king will come back Amen. and you will be lifted up. Amen. And he's preparing you for the trials and tribulations to be the type of person of leadership that God wants you to be. Story of Daniel. He was someone that was born in the palace. Was someone bred to be of importance. And then his life was turned upside down when Israel fell. Once again, because Israel could not follow the word of God and did the things that pleased them instead of what pleased God. But Daniel stayed firm. He believed in what God wanted for him. And the relationship with God he had, he prayed morning, noon, and night. That's a relationship. Because if you have a spouse and you do not have a relationship with them, except maybe once a week, that, that's not a relationship. You need a relationship when you get up. Good morning, honey. How are you? How What's you going to be doing today or something, you know? Let's have a word of prayer. And you call them during the day and says, is everything okay? You need anything? How, how is your day going? And at night, you said, oh, it's so nice to be back with you. And Right? A relationship. And God wants the same thing as to have a relationship. So, Daniel had a relationship. And what happened with Daniel? We know the story, right? He ended up being uh, taken as a prize, a tool, because he was educated so he could be used for Babylonian purposes. But he, instead, he rose to be second in command of Babylon. And it didn't just stop there because his character did not change because he loved God. When Babylon fell, where did he end up again? Second in command of Persia. And the story of the lion's den, it shows the story of Satan constantly fighting against us, causing us problems and grief when we are trying to serve God. He was put into the lion's den 
I fear not, because, you know, the words of Paul says, you kill me, I'll be with God. You persecute me, I'm in good company. You let me alone, I'll preach the word of God. Amen. You see, that was, all the patriarchs of the Bible had that philosophy in their heart. They, and when he was in the lions, then he prayed. And hungry lions, they do not sit like tame cats and watch. Their animal instinct says we need food in our stomachs and we want to eat. But they were still because an angel stood there and held them up shut. That's probably a metaphor because God can speak to the lions and take away their hunger pains. And I think that when the presence of God is with animals, they remember their creator. And the testimony that he gave the king of Persia, because he rent his clothes, he put on ashes of the sackcloth. Now, where did the king of Persia learn these things? Maybe the influence of Daniel in his life, someone that the king could confide with and talk not worrying that he's looking after his kingdom is to take it from him, but someone that he could trust. And he prayed to the God who was of his Daniels. And early that morning he ran to that tomb and called down, has the God who you serve in Jesus' life preserved you? And he says, don't worry king, I'm okay. And pulled him up. And then the king brought all those who accused him and they threw him in the lion's den. And then maybe that was just to prove that those lions weren't broken because they did not hit the floor before the lions tore him to shreds. God shows his love and mercy throughout the scriptures. The word of God is like a love story that talks to us, tells us how my father is loving you. Please, show mercy to your neighbor. Show kindness to your brother. In the life of Jesus, he demonstrated that in his behavior, his actions. And if sometimes you read the scriptures, and you're wondering, it says something here that seems contrary to what I hear in churches or, you know, church. It's because sometimes I think we get caught up in our ritual behavior in church and forget the heart portion of scriptures. Jesus showed that mercy was more important than uh, following rules, right? He showed that Sabbath had a bigger meaning than not doing any visible work. Yeah. Pacing off how far you can step. Worrying about turning on a light switch because it might spake a spark. It almost seems preposterous that we might think things, things like that, but God says the Sabbath was made for mankind, not mankind for the Sabbath. I don't think a Sabbath existed before God created this planet. On a Sabbath day that was made, was made as a day of rest for mankind to show that there's a relationship between God. Any of you that have children that you're separated because of sin, and you, and you get visitations once a week, isn't that wonderful that you get to spend that whole day with your kids? To spend time to reconnect, commune? Well, a Sabbath is like that. 
Sin has separated us from God. But the Sabbath is a chance to be with God. He loves us. He cares for us. Now when I say God, I say the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because they're in complete unity in everything that they do. God doesn't need appeasement so he could forgive you and love you because he already loved you. It says, from the foundation of the earth, God made a plan to redeem mankind before he even said, step foot on his planet. Amen. Why did he do that? Because he loves his children. If us, being evil, can do good things for our children, how much more will they, God, who loves us, do for his children? Amen. God loves us. Amen. When we understand how much God loves us, then we behave in a way that we love others. Because the principle of love is not like a set of arbitrary rules that we have, like 25 mile an hour speed limit in town and only 50 mile an hour when you're on the main road. Love is like the principle of gravity. If you fall off a high enough building, you will hit the ground with terminal velocity and die. Because it is a physical law of creation. And hatred, bitterness, uh, selfishness, egocentric, it all ends up being self-destructive. Just like a cancer that eats away at the body until there's nothing left to function anymore and you finally give up and die. We need to love one another. And this love doesn't come naturally anymore because the sins polluted our minds. We need to be close to God. Whatsoever you behold, you become. And if you behold the riches of this world, you behold rich and fame and big houses and fancy cars and, and a great lifestyle, then that is what you will become for whatever the cost may be. But if you behold your creator, your lover, your friend, then you will become like him and you will be transformed in that same way. Amen. You will become someone who loves his neighbor even though they may not love you. Bible uses the word least of these, and then it sometimes seems deceiving, but the least of these is the person that is least favored in God. Like when it talks about the least of these going into the kingdom, it's not talking about, you know, you're getting the spot by the gate, you know, a little, little shack. It's talking about those that rejected God. And if someone rejects God and hates you, but you still treat them with respect and love, that's the least of these. If you depend on having return or reciprocation of love from someone, then you're missing the real point because you accept the love that God gives you you love your neighbor because it's the right thing to do because God loves you first. So you do something nice for them and they don't appreciate it. But it doesn't matter if God appreciates it and you do it for God. Because if you depend on people giving you that reinforcement, yes, that's the good thing I did that, you know. You know some people do things and they say, oh, look at the praise, and they get these awards and all this stuff, and they line their walls with all their records of accomplishments. And that's their only reward. But if you put your rewards in heaven by 
doing what is right. Show compassion, love, caring, forgiveness. And I know there's people that do awful things in our lives. I know I have many I can tell you about. I can tell you that I'm the sole survivor of a drunk driver accident. Someone that was drunk, driving way too fast, crossed the double yellow line and hit my truck head on. But I have to forgive. There is no other way. Forgiveness is it's like a remedy. It's not for them as much as it is for you. God, let me ask you something else. You think the cross is the necessary punishment for your sins, right? That's what's taught in the Bible. Or, I, let me rephrase that, I'm sorry. That's what's taught in a lot of churches. But I'll tell you the truth. is the perfect life of God because God was on trial. Is his character a character of love, or is his character a character of a, a, a domineering bully? Because that's what Satan says, that his was unfair, unjust, that his power that he possessed feared everyone into submission. But God lived a perfect life. And in that scripture reading that I read, it was getting close to that time when his mission on this earth would be almost over. That he would be betrayed and Satan would have his moment with him. Because prior to that, the Holy Spirit's always been there with him. Angels at his beckoning call, not one of Satan's angels could get near him. Not even Satan himself. But for that short period. And that period of time, the universe saw the character of God. That he was willing to lay down his life. You see, it's not the life that he gave so as a punishment that God gave upon him that we may be saved. It was a life that he was willing to give to show that you can live a godly life. You see, this was the fuel that burned through all those that followed when they died in those arenas, on those crosses, as torches for sports events, because they knew that God was worthy to be loved and that he loved all of us. Okay. And most importantly, that he was the truth, the light, and the resurrection. That this life that we live here is like the life of a child that is yet unborn. That short nine months that seems towards the end of it, it gets so painful and unbearable, you can't wait till it's over. But then when it comes, you have such joy and glee and happiness that this beautiful baby girl or boy is born in your arms. Believe me, this life is short. And eternity is incredibly long. How we conduct ourselves here determines where we go. Not saying that our actions save us, but our determination. Last week, I uh, preached the story of the Beatitudes. And it showed the character that we were to possess. Because God up his enemy, he says, you know, you think that thou shalt not kill. But actually the word is thou shalt not murder. Take someone's life out of vengeance or uh, malice or uh, like Cain did. But he says, if you hate your brother, you break in this law. 
Because the essence of God's law is something that should be right here in your frontal cortex on how you make your decisions. You're going to live your life picking and choosing who you're going to hate and who you're going to love. You know, Moses brought down the Ten Commandments, which can be summed up, and Moses summed them up, he says, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's Moses talking, and Jesus reiterated it. It says, I give you a new commandment. That's, it says that in the New Testament. To love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the others like this, to love your neighbor as yourself, and the rest of these commandments hinge on that principle. It's because as like a fraction brought down to its lowest common denominator, love is in. If you love unconditionally, you are willing to help people. You are willing to do what is right. You are willing to sacrifice, to be close to God, because God sacrificed so much for you. So, that walk, and I can only think that Mel Gibson's passion, which I don't recommend as a movie title, but the only thing that he really got around on the money is the sadistic, evil way that our Savior was treated at that trial that mockery of a trial, and that trek up that hill where he was crucified. And that was the act of Satan. His character of evil, hatred, malice, murder, was demonstrated for the entire universe to see. There is no more that thought that God is unjust. There is no more in the universe that God is a tyrant. No more in the universe that God is unfair, that he keeps anything from his creatures that is good. And therefore, God has absolute right to say, you are forgiven of your sins. Go and sin no more. There is no pun not punishment, sacrifice, or blood offering that you have to give for that because God has said you are forgiven. You want blood offerings, join a pagan religion. There was only one sacrifice that meant everything. That was God's willingness to die on that cross for us. To demonstrate his love for humanity and the entire universe. God loves us. Absolutely, completely, with every fiber in his body. And if you doubt that, read the scriptures. Read the Bible from cover to cover. Use a concordance and read all the parts about God's love for humanity. Because the Father sent His only begotten Son so that you will not perish and have everlasting life. Amen. In the Old Testament it says, I wish I could gather you like a hen gathers his chicks. And if you know anything about hens, they are a sacrificial creature. They will give up their life to save their children. Any farmer knows that because if you have a barn fire and you see a dead hen and you turn it over gently, you'll see baby chicks underneath there that she had. God describes his sacrificial nature and his infinite love throughout the Bible. We should spend time to read the scriptures. Read how much God loves us. And not worry about all the other rules because, you know, Jesus says all that other law that was attached to the side of the ark, that was against you because you wanted to know how far we can push the envelope. You wanted to know when can you kill and when you can't. You wanted to know what you could do. How much can you get away with? How little did I need to give to God? Because that was the thinking. And then when you get on that type of attitude, you end up like our legal system with so much legal laws on every different thing. If you just love one another, all of that stuff would go away because love doesn't show malice to one another. Love 
does not belittle another person. Love does not bully someone. Love uplifts. Love helps with other people's burdens. Love carries. Amen. Amen. On that, we'll have a closing prayer and our closing hymn. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. That you love us so much. You were willing to bring heaven to earth. That you brought your only son who gave up his life willingly that he could restore us back to you. Thank you, God, for all your love for us. Give us the strength to love one another. Give us the strength to forgive. And give us the wisdom. Send your Holy Spirit upon us in our hearts that we can get a heart transformation and have a heart of yours and not the heart of rock that we born with. We pray this in Jesus' name, our King and Savior. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 108, Amazing Grace.